Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here to worship the Lord together. It's my family coming in late, and of course, I had to, I had to put them on the spot there. But uh, look, what a, what a morning we have today. God has been at work all week. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Boyd for coming and, and offering leadership in our worship, and sister-in-law, Bonnie. Bonnie. Yeah, thank you very much. Jerry's away in BC, uh, and we've got a guest speaker today, Reverend Dean McDonald, yeah, <laughs> who pastored here, associate pastor in the 80s, right? Not that long ago. <laughs> Great to have you, Dean. It's been a pleasure to get to know you more, too. As, uh, Dean was around, and I thought, well, we'll have to get him in here to, to speak, so thank you so much for bringing the word. Big update from Friday. We had our Avon View hot dog day, so we invite all the students to come down to the church and have a hot, two hot dogs, a pop, chips, and we had some 200 students come down here on Friday. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> a big thank you to everyone who helped out. Derek is gone this weekend, but uh, thank you to his leadership. And uh, those of us who are in the kitchen slaving away, Allison and Kareen and Lori and Peter, myself and... Uh, if I forgot anybody, please forgive me. Oh, yes, Anna Sanford. Where's Anna? She's somewhere. There you are. Yeah, we had some 400 hot dogs we gave away. And I think one guy was bragging that he ate 13, so. <laughs> Teenage guys, a big hole in his leg or something. I don't know. Um, yes, yeah, so that was a great day. Big answer to prayer. If you're new this morning, uh, take a Connect card in the seat in front of you, and we have a little box out there when you leave. Just fill in the information, and I'd love to connect with you and have a coffee and find out more how we can how we can help or what's going on in your life. Um, and maybe maybe you even have a prayer item. You just want prayer. Just put it in there and check confidential, and uh, we we will certainly honor that. I want to start off this morning with a verse that I was reading today in my devotional, and I was like, wow, God is so awesome. But hear these words from Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? He, did not, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? You know that God is the kind of God who wants to graciously give us all things. And the thing with the Christian faith is uh, it's not about earning or working. It's about believing and receiving. And I pray this morning that you receive the blessings of God that he wants to give you uh, and know that if he who gave his own son sacrificed so much, uh, why would he withhold anything from you? But the problem is we have a hard time coming to him sometimes. So this morning I pray that we come to him and that he increases our faith and that we trust and lean on him during this hour of worship. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for your grace in our lives. We thank you for sending Jesus, the one we've come to worship this morning. Thank you for the, for the worship team and for Boyd's leadership and, and uh, for the time that we're going to have for this morning, God. I pray that your spirit would be at work. Lord, be with Dean as he's going to bring the word and and I pray that as we draw closer to you this morning, God, you would draw closer to us and we would experience your presence in greater measure to help us with the week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. You can stand together as we start to sing along. Okay. For you that don't know me, my name is Boyd Langdon. I belong to Newfoundland and I also belong with the forces. So either way, I'm going to try to make it with you guys today and make it work. <laughs> Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as she know that your labor is not in vain for the Lord. It's a good Sunday, amen? Amen. I am resolved no longer to linger, drowned by the world's delight. Things that are higher.
Savior. And I tell you, this year I had to be led like you wouldn't believe. Sometimes I felt just like a baby. Honest to goodness. I've had, I, I got a story to just, tell. Just a second before we start, I want to say hello to Bud Lewis. Bud. Hi, Bud. I haven't seen Bud in a long time. You too. I say Good Bud to see you. one of the longest friends that we've known since we've been here. We've been yeah. in this area for about 18 years. I say I knew, knew Bud for about 17 years, 11 months of that. Yep. <laughs> so it was great. Amen. <laughs> Don't forget my cue. What's that? <laughs> Boyd? Don't forget to cue me in. Yeah. Yep. <laughs>
So, when the children are praising the Lord, let's have a few moments in prayer, shall we, before the kids go to discover? Uh, Lord, as we were standing there together singing and worshiping you, uh, that line, I pray that our gaze would be transfixed on you. Uh, Lord, as we worship you this morning, as we uh, try to get all the clutter out of our head and hearts and just kind of focus in on you and what you've done for us, I do pray that we would be transfixed on you. I pray that we would recognize that, uh, that you are all we need. We're thankful for the health care system. We're thankful for the education system. We're so thankful for our country, for its history, its past, and we know it's not perfect, but we're thankful for the shelter we have, the food that we have, the friends and family that we have. But most importantly, Lord, we're thankful for you, that you've given us this gift of life, given us this gift of life that you've, you've made us, and that through faith in Christ you've also saved us. Amen. Lord, I pray that everything that's causing us anxiety or concerns this morning would fade away as we transfix our eyes, our gaze on you, the one who came and the one who will return one day. We will be resurrected with the saints, so we look forward to that day. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I want to say a special thank you for Friday. A lot of timing and planning and prayers went into the hot dog day, and I pray that, that each student that came in here would have experienced the love of Jesus in a profound way. Uh, through our actions, Lord, that they would know that it's a safe place here to come and meet with God. Uh, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for the little ones going off to discover. We thank you for new life and for young ones in our midst. And Lord, I pray that you would use them in powerful ways for your kingdom. Lord, I just pray that your spirit will continue to work as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you later. See you, Guinevere. <laughs> and others. <laughs> and uh, where is Vinny? Oh, there you are, brother. <laughs> Reading today is in Psalm 63, and it's pretty much a match the song, too. Um, A Psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. O oh God, O oh my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being long for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and I beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the riches of food. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Oh, my bed, I remember you. I think I of you through the watch of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadows of your wings. I cling to you. You write and uphold me. 
Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depth of the, the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackal. But the king will rejoice in God. All who wear, wear by God will glory in him, while the mouth of liars will be silenced. Praise God. So, anyway, it's good to be here this morning. Uh, my son should have been here, Aaron. He's a great bass player, but who goes on their honeymoon just like that? <laughs> my daughter could have been here, but she's up in Bridgewater somewhere taking care of some drunk person, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's good to be here, guys. I love you guys very much. I'm humble. I, I, I'm, I think you already know I'm a little bit ADHD. And uh, so, a yeah, little? I still work with the forces. I think that's half the reason why they wanted me to work with the forces, because they think I'm in better shape than I am because of that. Uh, the chief came to me the other day. He said, the chief said, boy, do I have somebody coming on the watch with you. And uh, he gave me his name, and it was a young guy, 22, 23 years old. He had a 10-month-old kid, and what I didn't realize is that him and his partner split up about two weeks before that. So they brought him on the floor, and he was a precious young fellow and found out that he's got severe or uh, chronic mental illness. It wasn't, so, it wasn't so bad, but they seemed to like giving me uh, broken people sometimes. I shouldn't say it like that. I shouldn't say it like that. But uh, I don't know if you read in the paper, but there was a young guy, but 21 years old, that was diagnosed with chronic uh, mental illness. He was subjected to the ship until they could figure out where they were going to put him in the Q QE2 or whatever. He jumped off the ship, he landed on the pier, or the jetty, and he, he runs to the, uh, to the fire station. He steals the vehicle, and um, he rides off, and the, the police were chasing him. And I don't know if you read it right, but he went on some side road. He, 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 he ran into some big boulder of some sort, and he died about three hours later. There's a lot of mental illness. And one time, I would say, well, whatever. And... Uh, I've been dreaming a lot. I have a lot of nightmares. And uh, about six or eight months ago, it got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. My wife used to be waking me up in the middle of the night. It wasn't easy. It was not easy. And uh, so I got also diagnosed with PTSD. With the forces, it's easy to do that. It's easy because you go on to some deployments, and Vincent's back there, I'm looking at him, a precious man himself, and sometimes it's not easy. But I had to say to myself, I'm not human. The people that I helped to get through these things, now they were looking at me and reaching out to me and said, boy, you need help in certain ways. You ever hear the chorus, never failed me yet, he's never failed me yet, Jesus love has never failed me yet, and everywhere I go, I want the world to know that Jesus love has never failed me yet. You know what, I don't have any more nightmares. A sweet pastor one day called me aside on a Sunday morning and said, boy, we're praying for you. The nightmares were devastating. It was about death. It was about everything that was ugly. It was everything that was dark and black and everything you could imagine. I don't dream that anymore. I don't know the last time. It must have been two or three months since I've had that dream. God answers prayer. There's a song that says, you unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer slave to fear. Because I'm a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. Folks, I don't know what you did when you came in this place this morning, but I hope you closed the door to this world figuratively. Because if you don't, you've got to have a place where you can say, this is where things stop. Yes, I heard a good friend of mine had cancer this week, and I really did. And I really, really did not enjoy that news. But it's true. I don't like the fact that there's people hurting in this world. I don't like the fact that there's people that are evil that hurts other people. But this is the place to shut it all out and say, hey, this is the place to be healed. Amen? Amen. I know I talk a lot. I'm sorry. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. 
that this morning. We stand up on the word. Amen. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Here we are. What needs do we have this morning? Amen. Lifting our hands to you. I thank you, Lord, this morning. You are here, dwelling within our praise. Listen to this. For every answered prayer, and for always being there, and for love that is as well.
speaker this morning. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here and worship with everyone this morning. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about this fine gentleman. I'll, I'll use those words quite kindly. Um, a number of years ago, we were blessed to have Reverend Dean McDonald. He wasn't a reverend at that time, uh, but he did do his studies. And... Uh, <clears throat> One of the things that I will say is that Dean led me down through an awful lot of paths of doing youth programs with kids. We would have, you know, we had 200 here on, on Friday, and we would have a lot of different events like that. And I know there are a number of people here in our church family that are thankful that Dean was here to be our youth pastor, and he was a great youth leader. And... Uh, a lot, like I say, a lot of times he got me into a lot of trouble, but uh, <clears throat> we did manage to get through it. So I, it is my privilege to introduce to you my, one of my greatest best friends, Reverend Dean McDonald. Peter, I just want you to know you were in lots of trouble before I ever came along. <laughs>
The wonderful thing about getting old is you get a little more eccentric. <laughs> and I like that aspect, but this way uh, I can see a little better and I don't have to kind of have my head going up and down. <clears throat> Pastor asked me if I wanted to have one of the headsets around, but at my age, you know, if you wander off to the left or right, you might get over there and forgot why you're there <laughs> and not come back. So uh, I'm just going to stay kind of fixed here uh, to the microphone. Anyway, good morning. It's a great privilege for Louise and I to be with you this morning and join you in your worship together. I saw some of your worship online too, and I said, boy, they know how to worship there. So I was really thrilled. And to, just to be here in your beautiful new building, it's the uh, first time I've driven by some other times in the past, but uh, didn't have the opportunity to see in. Thank you, Pastor Rob, for your invitation to come and to serve. And if he gets into trouble, just go, af go after Peter, all right? <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell a little confession. I have a little confession. I went to YouTube just to kind of check out Windsor Baptist, see what your online presence was, but in particular, you know, see how long the sermons were. So, uh, so I know now I have another hour and a half <laughs> left. And, but uh, no, seriously, though, you, know, you do have a good online presence. And uh, I know it's a presence that draws people in and and people see what I saw, that there's a warm, caring, loving congregation here. I felt it ourselves as we experienced it here ourselves this morning. So I know as new people come, uh, they're not disappointed. And they're experiencing what they expected to come when they, when they came here. So I just want to give you some encouragement uh, about that. And uh, I just appreciate also what I saw was the openness, a lot of honesty about faith the struggles of life. We sung them here this morning. Thank you, Boyd. I think those songs really speak about what our experience is from day to day, and often it's like we're all so good and all so perfect, right? <clears throat> so I love reality when it comes, and we have the opportunity to do that. So um, I'm going to pray, and then we'll begin. Father, we, I just ask that um, the meditations of our hearts and our tenderness to you would be acceptable in your sight. And we look to you, God, to speak to our hearts. We want to be open to you, God, as you uh, present yourself this morning, even through this old guy here this morning. Lord, may your Holy Spirit speak and work, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you've rather guessed it, uh, this morning is a little bit like a homecoming for Louise and I. And as you know, we were here for uh, 33 years ago, but we had six wonderful years. And you know, when you move, you have to put down roots. You need to. You're stupid if you don't, because you need that support and caring from other people. And we didn't find it hard to put our roots down here in Windsor. I can't believe we were only here six years, because it was such a major, significant part of our lives when we came. Jeremy's only about five, and Nathan was just going into grade six. When we left, he's going into grade 12, and Rachel's in grade nine, and he's in grade six. So it's significant in their memory bank and experiences as well. So. Uh, uh, we were able to put our roots down, so we're thankful for that. And Because we felt the love and support of this congregation. I even feel it today, you know, as I came in and people we were greeting, talking with one another. So uh, I know many of those people that I knew have passed on, but I'm thankful there's still many familiar faces here today. And uh, so I'm grateful for that. I know you have many new people who are also bringing with them uh, their own families and their own experiences, so I'm thankful for that. Well, uh, I suspect you all had some special times during the summer. Uh, I think that's part of what summer is. My highlight of the summer was a family reunion just last month, and we meet every five years, and uh, I look forward to that, not necessarily all five years, but when you get in the last few months of it, and uh, so that's where my heart is today. So, uh, my own personal experience as a homecoming is rather wonderful uh, experience. I feel very privileged about it. And they started informally when we used to gather at my grandfather's farm during haying season. And some of you older folks will recognize that. It took a big crowd to do the haying in those days. Uh, horses and uh, lots of uh, other horse pulled machinery, but we had tractors as well and that kind of stuff. But uh, the day didn't end until it was too dark to, to uh, bring in any more hay. 
And then we'd all gather in my grandfather's living room for the nightly music. He played the violin in that whole area. So uh, he'd start out on those traditional country songs. And then that would gradually transition uh, into hymns. And then pretty soon after a while, everybody would be singing around the piano. And while he was playing the country tunes, my grandmother was always saying, George, George, play, play a hymn. She never caught on that he knew what to do. And uh, <laughs> he knew he was smart enough. He had a lot of uh, uh, grandchildren and uh, nephews and nieces and, and sons-in-laws that didn't know the Lord. So he just kind of had that little way of drawing people in and then moving and transitioning into those uh, kind of hymns. So it was a blessed time for me in my memory. My question for you today is this, you know, how do you get ready for a homecoming? You know, if you're a believer, there's going to be a great homecoming someday. Uh, but how do you get ready for a homecoming or even any family reunion as far as that's concerned? And I'm not talking about all the meal planning and all the details and that kind of thing. Those are external things. I'm talking about the heart, getting your heart ready to connect with people and in a situation. I think many people dread homecomings because maybe home was a terrible, abusive place for them. They don't have good experiences or they ended up with some conflict. So for a lot of people, that idea probably stirs up fear, waves of anger. Well, you won't be surprised to hear that the Bible has some guidelines and some advice about how we get ready, how to get ready for a homecoming. You know, almost nothing has happened to us or any of our lives that the Bible doesn't speak to, or somebody in the Bible uh, has already experienced what we are experiencing ourselves. So I want to talk this morning about an account in the life of Joseph. Joseph and his brothers uh, had uh, an incredible conflict uh, together. Uh, some of you know that story. Brothers sold him off into slavery, and uh, things didn't... Uh, weren't so great for him in his life. So actually there were two homecomings. There was the homecoming when uh, the prime minister of Egypt, who is now Joseph, if you like, sends uh, Joseph's family back, except for one brother, Simeon. He's held as a hostage. And so he wants his father, them to go back and bring his father to them. So that's one part of the, that's one homecoming. The second one is when they come back to Egypt with their father and uh, uh, his brother, younger brother, Benjamin. So I would just encourage you sometime to read more in Genesis 37 to 50, chapter 37 to 50. It's one of the most incredible accounts in the Bible. And it's so real about people and their emotions and their jealousies and their hatred and their bitterness and all this kind of stuff. And to see how Joseph was given wisdom by God to help unravel that within his family so they could have a good homecoming together. And he himself wouldn't be caught up in bitterness and, and hatred. So I read these words in Genesis 45, verse 24. <clears throat> and uh, these are the words that Joseph said to his brothers as he's sending them back to Canaan to get their father and Benjamin. And the verse reads, So he sent his brothers away, and they departed. And he said to them, See that you do not become troubled along the way. See that you do not become troubled along the way. So that got me thinking, you know, what kind of troubles was he thinking about? What was he thinking was going to the interactions between his brothers? Well, he knew his brothers, at least to some extent, some aspect of his brothers. So he knew some of the things that might take place. So I think one of those first things, number one, is going home with feelings of failure. Boy, have we all done that? Yeah, we go home sometimes with feelings of failure. Uh, maybe it's the work or the job or maybe all kinds of possibilities there. So in this story, Joseph is actually the 11th child. He's the 11th child. It's a very complicated relationship uh, and very complicated uh, family order, but he was 11 in the birth order. So it's not too surprising to realize that there was a lot of jealousy on the part of his brothers, because he was the favorite of his father. And he also, had father had announced to them that Joseph is going to get the birthright. Now, if you read and understand the history, the oldest child is the one who got the birthright. Now, what did that mean? The birthright meant that you inherited the father's uh, uh, wealth and resources. 
You took care of the father, though, in his older age, and the mother. That was part of the responsibility of the oldest child. So this responsibility then went to Joseph. Well, you know the story. Some of you know that story, but um, we'll get into it in a little more detail as we go along. But it's an amazing story of someone sold into slavery becoming the governor of Egypt. So as you know that story, there were seven years of fat years and seven lean years. And during uh, the lean years, they ran out of food in Canaan. So the father, Jacob, sent 10 of his sons, he kept Benjamin behind, sent 10 of his sons to Egypt to buy grain. And uh, one brother, though Simeon, was kept back, was put into prison by Joseph to make sure they came back with, his, with his, their father, Jacob, his father, and with Benjamin. He wanted to have them there in Egypt. He wanted to look after them. They don't know all of this, of course. And it's kind of, uh, the story is unveiled little bit by little bit because Joseph, I think, he's got problems in his own heart. Is he ready to forgive them? Uh, what's his reaction going to be? He's got a lot of power, a lot of authority. He can have these men executed like that. But he really wanted a genuine family reunion. Why wouldn't he want that? All those years, 10 years in prison all by himself, suffering away. And then recognizing you've been put initially in that situation by your brothers. So he, you know, if you think you and I deal with stuff in life, you think about that and think about some of the details of his life. So he wanted to have this relationship. So there's all kinds of reasons uh, what was on his mind about what the brothers might be going through their minds when they go home. But for you and I, it's a little bit, you know, maybe you've lost a job. Maybe, you'll, maybe you just couldn't keep up the mortgage and you're ashamed to even let your parents know or your family know about it. Or sometimes we, get, we go off somewhere to you take some kind of test and you fail the test and then you're, you're, you've got to come back and let people know you didn't make it, you know? So, uh, and you live maybe possibly with fear of failure, like if you have ADHD like I do. Still did, didn't know it about a year ago. Everybody else in the world did, but uh, I was sort of the last one to, to catch on to all of that. But I always recognized I was underachieving. I was underachieving. I had more ability, but the ADHD kind of kept getting in the way of that. But that's another story because I think God kept me humble. So I'd be willing to have him in my heart and in my life. Now, I know very well if I were wealthy and rich and all that and had power, I'd be the most arrogant person on the face of the earth. <laughs> and maybe you would be too. Maybe you would be too. I know we judge these people with power and wealth, but put yourself in the same kind of uh, situation there. Well, I think many of us know the story of the prodigal son. We're coming back, by the way, to Joseph. We're not going to leave them there, but you know the story of the prodigal son. Now, it's a parable. It's not a true story. But it's a familiar story, and it's a personal experience of many people going off, failing, and then uh, not knowing what to do. You know, a lot of people who are on the streets are there because they don't have a home to come back to. They failed, in a sense, or life has failed them, however you want to look at that, and they have no place to come back home to, you know? So uh, this is uh, one of the last generation to call the echo boomers. <laughs> And if some of you are parents my age, you know they come back <laughs> for some time, periods of time, to get themselves reorientated and off again. So um, the story of the prodigal son uh, depicts all this in a very significant way. So this young man in the story ends up uh, feeding the pigs. Now, we just kind of read that and say, well, that's not the greatest job in the world. Listen, if you are from a Jewish background, if you listed all the jobs that existed in the face of the universe, this would be the last job. You've got to understand, the Bible forbid them to eat pork, eat meat, you know, and so on. And so to, so to this day, they avoid it. It's an anathema to the Jewish people. And so here he is, feeding the pigs, living with the pigs, you know. Uh, I remember, well, cleaning out my grandfather's uh, pig pen. <laughs> Anybody done that? Yeah. yeah. Make sure you clean your boots off, eh? Right. 
And you know something, you, you don't realize, if you give them space, pigs can be the cleanest thing in the world. When you first clean that page, cage, they just keep that so clean, they just go to one end, but you know, you just didn't in a hurry, and after a while the whole cage, the whole pen was covered, right? But I didn't mind cleaning it out. You know why? We love our bacon, <laughs> right? We love our roast pork, right? We love our hams. So it was certainly not an anathema for me, right? But anyway, this young man has uh, faced that dilemma. And finally, when he goes home, of course, he's there and has that homecoming and that wonderful experience of his father. There's so much in there that when Jesus told this story, the thing that I love most is the father never stopped looking. He never stopped looking down the road for that day that his son would come back. What a loving father. That's what Jesus was trying to point out, how loving our father is for you and me. Okay, number two. There's also the danger of going home with all of our doubts and fears, fears of rejection. And uh, so that's the story here of Jacob and Esau in chapters 22 of Genesis and 23. I'll just try to summarize it quickly here, but it's a story that doesn't start well, but thank God it ends well. And so... In this story, Jacob, uh, if you know the story, when J Jacob and Esau, they were twins. Who was born first? Esau. Esau. But he wasn't born alone. Why? Because Jacob was handing, handling, hanging onto his heel. It's kind of a, a prophetic thing about the younger brother being ambitious, you know? Like Prince Harry, give him a kick, right? So... Um, <laughs> But he was kind of hanging on. And uh, so that's what happened in this particular situation. So the mother plotted to have her son, um, uh, Jacob, sorry, her son Jacob, get the birthright. So, you know, the, the story was he put on sheep's wool there. His brother was hairy. He was hair, not hairless, but less hair and so on disguised him, the father was blind, and he gives the birthright. So naturally, when Esau heard that the father had given the birthright to Jacob, he was prepared to kill Jacob. And that wasn't just figurative language. He was prepared to kill Jacob because he had been cheated out of his fortune, if you like, his family uh, inheritance, and a, and a special blessing uh, from the father for him and for his life. Eventually... Uh, Jacob regrets what he's done. And of course, he had to flee. He went away. Uh, he married the daughter of a rich man. He became wealthy himself. There's several miracles there about how all the sheep got to be his and so on. But anyway, uh, as we read the story, he regretted what he had done. And he decided he wanted to repay Esau for what he took from him. And so he took these large flocks of sheep I better not say goats, herds of goats, herds of cattle, herds of donkey, large. He had a lot, tremendous wealth. He took those with him, and along with a lot of servants and so on. So, but he was fearful, and for good reason, because as you read, Esau heard about it. He heard Jacob was coming, so he got 400 men together with weapons, I'm sure. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but you can be sure... They were well weaponized, and they are going to catch this guy, and he's going to get what he deserves. But Joseph was wise. God had given him wisdom. So, so he sent off a flock of sheep, a large flock of sheep. Then he sent off a, flock, a herd of goats. And then, I don't know if the donkeys came for the cows, whatever, off, but one by one he sent those off. And that began to touch and speak each time he did that. I don't know if they were hours apart. It's hard to tell from the Bible over what period of time it took place, not more than a few, one or two days anyway. So it, it touches uh, Esau's heart. And Esau was a very carnal man. If you know the story more about Esau, he was a carnal man because he sold his whole birthright for a, a, a bowl of uh, pottage. But they were really were, what's that bean that you love, Louise, in soup? And I don't think so much of them anyway. Lentils, yes. <laughs> I would give all the lentils in the world for a few things, right? No, he did it. He did it for a, a bowl of lentils. They were well spiced and some meat and so on. 
But anyway, that's uh, what happened to Esau. He was a carnal man. But thank God he was touched by the generosity of his brother, Jacob. And uh, so we read this in the story. By the way, I should say this. Sometimes when we're looking for reconciliation, we just expect things too fast. You know, when Louise and I were first married, we had a little tiff there. I don't know what it was. I know it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that too, right? <laughs> So anyway, uh, so being ADHD, I was very quick coming over and said, I'm sorry. And Louise just quietly said, I know. She said, just give me a little time. Just give me a little time. And I said, oh, OK, yeah. She processes differently than I do, right? So that was a good lesson learned for me there. So that's why I think Esau or Jacob was so wise in terms of how he sent these gifts off to Esau. So it says this in Genesis 33, 4. Might be up on the screen there now. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. And they wept. All the, all the hurts and all the bitterness and all those things came tumbling out as their tears went rolling down. Praise God for that. My friends, that's the beginning of a great family reunion, isn't it? And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now another uh, trouble that uh, Joseph had for his brothers, not that they would have their doubts and their fears, but I think he was fearful they'd go home with unforgiveness in their hearts as well as his own heart. You know, there's nothing on the face of this earth that's more destructive than unforgiveness. Because unforgiveness just will gradually build up in such a root of bitterness that it just... Uh, Hard to break through that. So unchecked, unforgiveness leads to even vengeful actions. You know about all that. And maybe you've been there yourselves. You know, it just sucks the joy out of our lives. And it kills the joy in the lives of other people as well. But the truth is, many people would rather live full of hate than full of love. And you know, you hear this on the news every day. It's like whole countries have been educated to hate and to reject love instead. You know, it usually begins with a child being wounded somehow. Children get wounded a lot of different ways. A wrong word said at a certain time uh, on some unfairness, some injustice. But if those wounds are unintended, they grow, they fester. The wounded child becomes a wounded adult. And when they're wounded adults, boy, can they do a lot of damage. A wounded child can complain, they can cry, they can whine, they can howl, but a wounded adult can kill, right? A wounded adult can kill a lot of things. So, so in this true story of Joseph, and I really want to encourage you, chapters 37 to 50, take some time to read it. You won't find it hard. If you find it hard reading the Bible, go right here. You'll just be fascinated by the story as you read in there. And we saw that it was a very complicated family and all the jealousy and everything that took place. Uh, but, uh, of course, you know that he explained those prophetic dreams to Pharaoh and so on. I'm trying to be a little more briefer with all of this here. Um, I think, you know, what really turned at the edge was when Joseph... Uh, when Jacob gives Joseph that coat of many colors, right? They're already dealing with the hurts and the wounds and feelings, rejection of your father. And Joseph, 16 year old or so, he kind of walks off with this new coat, sporting the new coat. He's 16. He's not sensitive to what they're feeling. His father loves him to death and cares for him. He's just kind of living in an oblivious world, right? And not sensitive to how and his brothers are interpreting all of that kind of uh, situation. And uh, so, uh, of course, they do what they did. And uh, they wanted to kill him, but rather than do that, they put him in a, a cistern and he sold off to the Midianites. That was in one of the questions there uh, before uh, about the Midianites. Who did the Midianites put, uh, so go off into, uh, well, they sold off into slavery, went off to Egypt in jail, Potiphar, I guess, uh, part of that story. Anyway, I better get on with it here. So. Um, so I did a little study. This got me in. I, I did a little more study here and all this. And just to kind of summarize a little bit, 
Eight times. Not once, not twice. Eight times it says that Joseph wept. Just to get an idea of how deep his hurts were. Eight times in the story he wept. When he saw the brothers, didn't let him know who he was. But he wept. He wept so loud it could be heard in Pharaoh's palace. You know? And you know... When it said wept, it didn't mean he had a little bit of a teary eye or anything like that. If you've ever been hurt, you'll understand that when you weep, you weep with your whole body. Some of you know what I mean. You weep with your whole body. And Joseph wept. The pain was so deep and the sobs so loud, you know, but healing came in and through that. And so the father, before he died, told, said to the brothers, this is what you are to say to Pharaoh. And they did that. And I knew as they said, as they said those words, Joseph knew they were sincere. And they are Genesis 50, 16 to 17. I'll give you a chance to go up on the screen there. Genesis chapter 50, verses 16 to 17. And so they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying that you say to Joseph, I beg you, please, Forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. No, please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. I think it's supposed to say now. Does it say now? Yes. Yeah, I've got no here. <laughs> so now, please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And so Joseph replies very graciously with these words, Verse 20, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people's lives. So Joseph, you know, himself finally realized, oh, God all meant this for good. I wouldn't have been able to save my brothers. I wouldn't have been able to save my father, my brother Benjamin, and so on. And he brings them all to Egypt because he has that power and Pharaoh uh, just... Uh, so thankful for Joseph and what the difference Joseph made in his life. <clears throat> so, brothers, those brothers wanted to have a clean slate when they went to see Joseph. They wanted to be forgiven. You know, I think we can see uh, that Joseph suffered so much because of what they've done, and they knew that, but they wanted to have a clean slate. And you know, we want to have a clean slate. That great family, when we come before Jesus and we see Jesus, we want to have a clean slate. We don't want to have all that garbage uh, dripping off of us, you know. And, you know, I noticed in the accounts that when the brothers washed their feet before entering the house of the governor, Joseph, they washed their feet. You know, water can wash off dirt, but water doesn't wash off sin. Only the shed blood of Jesus can wash off the sin from our lives. And so as we fall, we prostrate before Jesus. Then and beg his forgiveness. All of that is removed. God says, it's gone forever. You'll see it no more. It says, I've buried it as deep as the, the depths of the sea. I, re, I love this one. He says, I choose, I remember it no more. He chooses to remember it no more. And you know, when we forgive people, you don't forget what happened. But when you choose to forgive, you're saying, I remember it no more. It's like, I'm not going to bring this up again. I'm not going to dig this up again here. So only Jesus can do that. I want to share my brother's experience. And, and uh, he, you know, I have permission to do that. He's passed away since. But um, 26 years ago, my brother received word that he was terminal with an autoimmune disorder. It was called Wagner's disease. And the doctor told him he had about three months to live. My brother was a believer. He became a believer a little later in life. He was around age 40 or so. But uh, like the rest of us, he knew that there were aspects of his relationships with people that needed to be attended to. He wanted to have a clean slate. And so he publicly shared, you know, uh, what I'm about to tell you here. So as soon as he came home from the hospital, he went looking for his wife, Leah. She's still living, but she's in a nursing home and in her latter days there, you know. But he wanted to see her because he wanted to tell her how much he loved her. Now, that doesn't surprise you, but up to this point in his life, he never told anyone that he loved him. He had never told his wife that he loved her. She knew it. 
She knew he loved her, but she had never verbalized that. I don't know why. Some kind of barrier or block was there, you know? I don't even know to this day. I just know that some little barriers can build up that can be easily broken. And so he went to my mother and sat down with my mother and told my mother that he loved her and asked forgiveness for things in the past and maybe perhaps things he could have done better as a son and so on. Same with Leah, he could have been a better husband. And then he sat down with each of his three children, two boys and a girl, one by one, apologized for things perhaps he had said and done and not done. And then with his brothers and sisters, I remember him sitting down with me, I'll never forget it, and telling me that he regretted not being a better brother, and he was still on that point. He could have been a better brother, I know that. I was six years younger than him, so when I'm six and he's 12, you know, we didn't have too much of a relationship. When I'm 12 and he's 18, same thing. When I'm 18, he's 24, he's got three kids. <laughs> I, I didn't develop a relationship with my brother till I was in my 30s, you know. But he did that. And frankly, friends, I can tell you this. I've never seen anybody with a greater thirst for holiness in my life. He was determined to have a clean slate before God, before his time came, before God called him home. Now, God blessed him. You know the story of Hezekiah? Has a God called Hezekiah, Hezekiah, I, your, your life is gonna end. You haven't been a faithful your life is gonna end. And Hezekiah begged forgiveness and God gave him 15 more years. You know, God gave my brother 18 more years. Yeah. 18 more years. Yeah. And he didn't waste them. He didn't waste them. Like an uncle told me on his deathbed, he said, I've wasted my life. He made a commitment at 12 and never followed through. He said, I've wasted my life. So God wants us home with him. He wants all of his children home with him for all of eternity. And you know, he doesn't make it hard. I love this verse from Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. In other words, you knock on my door, I'm going to open that door and you can be part of my family forever, right? Just confess our sins and seek to follow him. You know, one day there's going to be a great banquet in heaven. A great banquet. All the children are going to sit down. All of God's children are going to sit down at the marriage feast of the Lamb. Do you know who's been invited? Everybody. He's not willing that any should perish. But sadly, so many turn down that invitation. He doesn't ask us to climb uh, or rappel down uh, a high tower, which I did a couple of years ago for a fundraiser or whatever, live to tell the tale. He doesn't ask us to do those kinds of things, to confess our sins, give our lives over to him, and to trust him. And so uh, I just encourage you to do that. Let's pray together. Father, I, I don't know where all these people are at. I know if they're like any church situation, there are some people that have just been reneging, haven't been making that decision. And Lord, don't let them put it off. And maybe you've been following Jesus, but then got back and you've been in a dry place. You don't have to stay in a dry place. We have such a loving Savior. So Lord God, we pray your blessing on this congregation today and the people gathered here. And we pray the power and the presence of Jesus in their lives. Life-changing experience. Lord, use this church to bless Windsor and beyond. Reach out to the people. Thank you for that. 200 young people coming uh, just the other day, Lord. And so we pray your Holy Spirit will empower these people to do what you're calling them to do. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I didn't realize where the Jewish community weren't allowed to have pork and I realize that is very true. Well, on my floor, I also work with a Muslim guy. He's 23 years old, he's a practicing Muslim, and he's very proud of that, but he can be very lazy, and he's a kid, he's a small kid. And so one day he really ticked me off, and I said, like, like you've got to, like, so anyway, 
I don't know if you know, there's an app called Flash Food, and I, ended up, I found bacon for 50 cents a pack. <laughs> and I looked at Ahmed, his name is Ahmed, but I can't say it that good. I said, you're going to go to the store and pick something up for me. Anything for you, Master Sailor? I said, you're going to pick up bacon down in Barrington Street. He looked at me seriously. You know, we're not allowed to be eating that. So you're not going to eat my bacon. You're going to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> now it feels guilty about it. Where's the preacher to? <laughs> Wherever you are. But, you know, it's good to be here. I have Salvation Army roots. When I was born, I was Salvation Army. My dad was a minister for a few years. So a lot of times when I come out and deliver this to you, it's kind of like me if I was in the Salvation Army. I apologize for it, and then I don't apologize for it because I think you guys all had a wonderful time today. It's a great sermon. It's a great message we had. Uh, let's stand. There's one more song. And this is an older one. I like this song because... I've known it for years and years and years. This probably came from the Salvation Army, for what I know. But it's a nice song, and uh, it tells you everything. So we didn't give a testimony this morning. Here it is. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, all day long, for Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. We could never pay it, amen? amen. And even today, we make mistakes. I challenged somebody at one time, I said, can you go an hour without sinning? And he said, no, I don't sin. You doubt, you fear, you, have, you worry. You, you, we are not, we're not perfect people. I'm not perfect by a long shot, but I'm glad for that, that you see here this morning. He paid that debt, amen? In the eyes of God, we are perfect, amen? Thank you, Jesus. Are we ready for this? We're ready for it. <laughs> he paid a debt. All day long for Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. My debt he paid on Calvary. He cleansed my soul from all his trust. I thought that no one could all my sins erase. But now I see. Could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. But now I sing a new song of amazing grace. All day long, for Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Oh, such, oh, such great. Jesus. 
Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid a debt he did not know. I owed a debt I did not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Amen. Brand new song, amazing grace. All day long, and I Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Amen. Amen. I just thought about something before we finish. We're being taped, aren't we? Oh, dear. Oh, Mark, I did, didn't see this one. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yeah, it's all on film, Boyd. <laughs> Your co-workers are going to love you now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate that. I'll have to have you back again. Thank you, Reverend McDonald, Dean, for preaching the word this morning. Really encouraging. Yeah. To Hear some of your family story, too. That was really touching. Uh, as we look forward to this coming week, we've got a few things going on. Uh, youth group is Wednesday night at 6.30. we got a campfire. That's always fun. A men's breakfast is this Saturday, 8 o'clock. Uh, family movie night this Saturday, too, at 6.30. I think last week I said 5.30. It's at 6.30. It didn't make the handout. Uh, Derek thought of the date after, and that's okay. But we're going to be watching The Redemption of Henry Myers, and I tell everybody we got the best popcorn in town. So, uh, so it's a Western movie, so come on out for that uh, this Saturday at 6.30. And I want to close off. I started reading a bit in Romans 8, and here's how Paul closed off the chapter. He said, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for today, God. Thank you for the words we heard, for the songs that we sung. Thank you for your amazing love. And as we heard the invitation this morning for all to come, I pray that if that touched anyone this morning, that they, they would know that they can come talk to me after or, or connect with me throughout the week, and I'd love to talk to them more about starting a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that all of us would be ready to meet our King, Thank you for your love and grace, Lord Jesus. May you be exalted and glorified through our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless everybody. You too. Well, I had to sing roles, so it was really hard. Good job. That was a pleasure.